You play to win. You play to go to the Super Bowl. If you don't get there, you don't get there. But it doesn't mean you're a failure. You put it out there, you try, you win, you lose, you reach your goals, you don't. That's all part of it. That's part of life. remember like it was yesterday. Driving to the stadium, I lived in the Pacific Beach at the time, driving down Interstate 8 towards the stadium and felt like what I thought was a sonic boom. All of a sudden uh, over the radio, there's been this horrible plane crash, total devastation in a major part of San Diego proper. I was driving on 805 getting to the stadium and there was uh, literally clothes and suitcases uh, on the highway. I run into Jerry McGee, longtime great columnist, covered the Chargers, beat writer. He comes around and he goes, wow, what do you think about the news? And I go, God, it's horrible, isn't it? I mean, it's just the worst thing ever. And he goes, no, it's, it's the worst you've ever heard? I go, yeah, it's horrible, it's, it's devastation. Hiring Don Coriel is the worst thing you've ever heard? And I go, dude, have you not heard about the plane crash? And he hadn't heard about the plane crash. I will never forget the same day, one of the worst, darkest days in San Diego history, turned out to be one of the brightest sports days in San Diego history. In comes this whirlwind, Don Coriel. And I remember him saying, you guys are one in three, you haven't won in a long time. People think I'm crazy to take this job. He says, well guys, I tell you what, we all gotta be a little bit crazy to play this game. And with that, we all started laughing and we never stopped laughing until it was over. We love the city and the area of San Diego, the people here. We've lived here for so many years. It's, uh, it's coming back home. It's, it's our home. Don Coriel was already a local fan favorite. At San Diego State, he won more than 80% of his games with an innovative passing offense that shattered numerous collegiate records. This success earned him a head coaching job with the St. Louis Cardinals who ended a 25-year playoff drought following his arrival. After leaving St. Louis in 1977, Coriel seemed the perfect choice to rescue the struggling Chargers. Coach Coriel loves football. He loves his players. Didn't want to get involved in contract negotiations, didn't want to be involved with ownership issues. He wanted to get on the field. He wanted to coach. Never in my life have I seen a guy that was so intense about what he loved, which was the game. I mean, he'd look right through you. He'd walk down a hall. Coach, how you doing? Just walk right by you. Is he pissed at me? Did I say something wrong? And he had, there was no malice. He would just focus on little things. He would get lost in his own little world. If we needed popsicles for practice, that was the biggest thing that day. Forget practice plans. Oh hell, we need popsicles. We need to get our guys happy for a little break during training camp. The most important thing to me about Don Coriel is that he actually cared about us as players. Don was always a guy that made you feel important. Your contributions to the offense or to the meetings or to the team or to the locker room was part of the deal and was all we were all in this together. That's just him as a human being. I don't think there's ever been a coach who was more courageous about creating offense. Basically, it had to do with the passing game, obviously, but also with formations and use of personnel. Seeing a player that could do more than one thing. Maybe this 
tight end could line up outside wide and create a mismatch, you know, like Kellen Winslow. He wanted to spread the field, he wanted to throw the football. Different formations, different ways to get things happen, looking for that mismatch, always trying to be innovative. It was the ideal marriage of tactics and talent. Besides Winslow, the Chargers were blessed with future Hall of Fame receiver Charlie Joyner, number 18, whose precision routes complemented the athletic ability of number 83, John Jefferson. The beauty of Gary Coriel is it's good against any defense. You want to pressure, it's fine. You want to stack to stop the run, fine. You, you want to be stupid and try to play man coverage outside, fine. It was all timing and reads by the receivers, reads by the quarterback, very difficult to defend. And nobody had seen that. In 1978, Air Coriel propelled the Chargers to their first winning season in nearly 10 years. By 1979, Jack Murphy Stadium was running on Charger power. All of a sudden, there's this collection of great talent, personalities, and a chance to really do something, and we were doing it. And this city was insane. It was on fire. I mean, you were nobody if you didn't have a Charger Power t-shirt back in the days of disco with your big hair and everything else. We were the first big thing sports-wise in San Diego. And we kind of realized we fed off the energy from the fans. This town was rocking. I mean, it was awesome. Hank Bauer himself became an object of affection for fans who appreciated the bread and butter back of Coriel's gourmet offense. We started putting him in, in short yard situations because he would just take the ball and dive head first into anything. And oftentimes that anything was the end zone. So that was good and the fans liked that and he'd get up and jump around. And in those days, not a lot of guys jumped around after they scored and celebrated, but Hank was so excited to get in the game and then excited to get into the end zone. You know, it's not easy being 23, 24 years old and being totally bald. In those days, nobody was shaving his head, their heads. He was just, uh, he was uh, uh, follically challenged. Like Pat Kern and Louis Kelter used to tell me, short, white, and bald is no way to go through life. <laughs> Do the best you can, pal. <laughs> when the Chargers traded for power runner Chuck Muncie, Bowers' role evolved from short yardage back to special teams headhunter. I think anybody that is worth their salt should be wanting to play their position. But you know, you got guys like Muncie and Brooks who are the best in the world at what they do. Hey, I'll sit and wait my turn when they need me, I'll go. But if I want to be on the special teams, I want to be the best at whatever I do. I just want to get out and hit people, that's all. That's when special teams players were just starting to get noticed. I mean, how can you not notice a guy that's making every tackle? I mean, Hank was all over the place. I look back at the numbers and it's, I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy numbers. In 81, we had 119 returns against us. I made 52 tackles. This is still an NFL record. That the guy that made the Pro Bowl last year at 18. You have to have a Hank Bauer on your football team an overachiever because then it forces people who were gifted, you know, that natural ability to ask themselves, why am I not working harder? He's a guy who pushes everybody else. Bauer's energy inspired the team, but the recognized leader of the San Diego Chargers was their quarterback. Dan Fouts wore a hat all week long, MFIC in charge and he was definitely that he knew it we knew it the smartest toughest quarterback i have ever seen 11 11 that's okay 11 i feel a little bit embarrassed looking back on it and hearing these stories about what a what a tough uh, means sob i might have been in the huddle at times damn it son of a out of here 
I think they realized that I was just trying to trying to get us all on the same page, get in the end zone. Bounce the quarterback, fires up downfield, the touchdown. I, I really didn't make myself clear. I meant. Well, I, th I think I understood you. you just, is, is that what you wanted? A yeah, touchdown? I, I wanted <laughs> we were a better football team when Dan Faust stepped in the huddle. No doubt about it. Everybody played harder because they didn't want to disappoint Dan. He expected perfection from everybody. And when you didn't do those things, he would tell you. Work the middle, True. Work the middle on that. Cut your split down, work the middle. Whether it was a running back for missing a blitz or not, you know, being where they're supposed to be, whether it was a receiver. And Dan and I had our, you know, little tips from time to time. Come on, run out of the brakes now. Lead it on. Run out of the brake. That's what I'm doing. You run out of the brakes. I'm running out the brake. Tippy towing like a. You want to find another damn tight end? I will. And you're out of here. You're out of here. So when he would yell at me, sometimes I would yell back at him, but there was a mutual respect. There was never anything ill intended about it. That moment of conflict made us a better unit. Good job, Kel. Way to fight in there for me, babe. Way to go, Jimmy. When Dan Boss was in the huddle, you know, we believed we could do anything. In 1979, Fouts led the league in passing, but in the opening round of the playoffs, he threw five interceptions and an upset loss to Houston. For them to come into San Diego and beat us as they did, you gotta give them credit. Wish I had played better. We were just off, and I was just off a lot. A year later, the Chargers reached the conference title game, but fell short against the eventual world champion Raiders. You look back and you go, damn, how'd that happen? Such a journey to even get into the playoffs is hard. Getting to a Super Bowl is hard. The Oakland Raiders currently reign as world champions, but there are those who feel that the team that trains right here in La Jolla, California, the San Diego Chargers, will not only dethrone Oakland as the champions of the AFC, but will go on to win it all in 1981. Well, I wouldn't trade any of our talent with anybody else's. I think that uh, we do have some very talented people, and, uh, and that talent is maturing now, and I think that uh, with the two years now that we've had in the playoffs, that they're going to be a benefit to us this year. San Diego's most skilled pass rusher was future Hall of Famer Fred Dean, number 71. Incredible upper body strength that allowed him uh, to either run around a blocker or use his long arms to move the blocker out of the way. So Fred was really a, a unique player. But beating up quarterbacks wasn't Fred Dean's only talent. I'm Freddie Dean. People tend to call me me. Cause I'm the baddest dude. A quarterback has ever seen Before the day is done You'll remember number 71 We thought we could sing, so why not give it a try? Fred Dean, Leroy Jones, Charles DeJournay came up with a concept of adding John Jefferson and Kellen Winslow and we formed a group called The High Five. We're going, going away. And the name of the album was The Other Side of Us. Of course, this is one side being a football player, the other side is the singers, the crooners, etc., etc. I think we sold uh, maybe 100 albums. I think I bought 99 of those. <laughs> In the summer of 81, Dean and John Jefferson were singing a more melancholy tune. They informed Chargers owner Gene Klein they believed their skills were underappreciated and that neither would report to training camp if changes weren't made. 
That was the year John Jefferson and Fred Dean decided they wanted more money again. And Gene Klein had already renegotiated their contracts and got fed up. Simple as that. At the time, none of us made any money. JJ got screwed, we all got screwed. JJ was the best receiver in football. And he was tied up in a contract that should have been torn up after his first year. JJ was such a big part of it, not only for his production, but for the spirit he gave our team. It was very disheartening to see him being treated this way. Teams are saying, we've got to stop these people. What can you do as an encore? Well, as an encore, first of all, we can get John Jefferson into camp. Um, that would be our first step. Jefferson misses football. He admits that. But he says he is determined not to go back to the Chargers until he gets the contract he wants. And he says, yes, he will sit out the entire season if necessary. John Jefferson has been a remarkably fine football player, wonderful young man to work with. And we are indeed sorry that the situation turned this way. Klein stood his ground throughout the contentious summer. The rest of the Chargers grew so frustrated that they eventually pushed back by staging a team-wide boycott. Similar to the Vince Lombardi... Uh, we always had this Charger backer luncheon that most of the players would go to and sit at the table with the fans. As a show of solidarity, we decided not to go to the Charger backer luncheon. There's a way of saying to management, we need to get this done. We need to get this resolved. And um, the way they got it resolved was they traded both players. John got traded to Green Bay, and Fred Dean got traded to San Francisco. So not only did management break up the team on the field, they broke up my performing group. That was a double hit for us. And now all of a sudden, a couple of the key pieces to that puzzle are missing. Okay, so what do we do? So what do we do? Well, the only thing you can do as a player, you can only control what you control. So you play your asses off. And we did it all that night. We put it together. Oh boy. And I got to score my last NFL touchdown right there in front of the dog pound. You know, it was our statement to let people know, okay, we lost a couple guys, but hey, don't give us up for dead yet. Okay, we'll go far right, 50, belly on blue, ready? If you look at our team in that era, on offense, we ran the same offense forever. But every once in a while, every two or three years, we're changing defensive coordinators. When you change a coordinator, you change your defense, defensive philosophy, but you also change personnel to fit that philosophy. And believe me, you can't do that every year and have the consistency. You need to be a championship team. Despite the presence of some individual stars, San Diego's defenders were seldom in the spotlight. Here's an accepted thing. You're a second-class citizen if you play defense with the Chargers in the 80s. Simple deal. We have an offensive coach. We have offensive star power. We're the most dynamic offense in the history of the game. And I'm sure those guys felt like they were second-class citizens. Now with Fred Dean no longer on the roster, the defense's misfortunes worsened. Can't put pressure on the quarterback. An average quarterback, a less than average quarterback, could have a big day on you. The loss of Fred Dean, it just changes everything. If you don't have those role players, then you're putting more pressure on a secondary. You're asking more of them to do it. Worn down Chargers defenders found themselves lunging for opposing ball carriers, while their apologists grasp for excuses. Weirdest thing I ever heard somebody say is that they felt that our offense scored too quickly, which I still don't understand because isn't that our job is to score? And do we really have any choice as to how quickly we scored? Can we really take eight minutes off the clock each time or is it better to do it in three plays? We score a touchdown, go out there, 
play three downs, stop them, force them to punt the football, we'll score again. You know, it's your fault you let them go 18 plays. Who says you can't stop them? Shut up, stop them, get off the field. San Diego's problems weren't just on defense. The offense was getting by with backup receivers, but still not compensating for the loss of John Jefferson. It was the long-term approach that we were concerned about of not having a receiver that quality throughout the entire year. You can always cover things up for a couple of weeks, but over 16 games, it's gonna show. You let management know, we need help. You wanna win it all, or are you in it for the money? Well, we wanna win it all. So, so help us out here, will you? And I'll tell you what, they helped us out. They helped us out. I would have never thought in my wildest dreams that you could replace John Jefferson, but you did. A couple of members of the media came up and told me that they had just traded for West Chandler. I remember saying in that very flippant way, that very flippant mouth I had at the time and still do, is it's about time they did something right. The players and the organization as a whole has really, really adapted to me. They took me in and uh, made me a part of this big, happy family. And uh, when you have a pure passer such as Dan Faust, from a receiving standpoint, it's like dying and going to heaven. Chandler soon changed his jersey number to 89 and also changed the way he ran pass patterns. He worked extremely hard to get his timing with me because he's so fast, I had problems with some of the timing routes. And so he literally had to slow down a little bit to make it all work. Everything that John Jefferson brought us in terms of energy and catches and big plays and everything else. And I hate to say it, JJ, but Wes Chandler was every bit as good. Wes is special now. With Chandler in the lineup, the Chargers would set a league record for passing yards. In 1981, Air Coriel was the league's number one ranked offense, and at midseason, the Chargers appeared unstoppable. In late October, the first place Chargers went into a tailspin, losing three of their next four games. Boss with the ball will drop back to throw. Fires off into the corner. It's intercepted in the end zone. Lloyd Breeden picks it off. Gets out to the 15. Running along the sidelines. Only one man in the way. And he will go for a touchdown. A lopsided loss to the Bengals was followed by a sleepwalk in Seattle. We never, ever lose this. The dog-ass Seattle Seahawks, are you kidding? Much less on Monday Night Football? And they hammered us, and they earned it. They deserved it, they kicked their ass. We sucked on defense. Well, you know what, we sucked on offense. We sucked in the kicking game. Waiting for the snap from center. That's a good one, they throw a fake, they give inside to Sherman Spencer, takes off to the five, he's in the end zone, touchdown! All of a sudden, you come up with a big play against us, and uh, it was sometimes where uh, you start looking around going, well, hey, it's, you know, we, we were doing our job. It's not uh, our fault, and you, know, you just can't have that. We're a team, and we got to play together. We had a big team meeting just before we went up to play Oakland. When we were sitting at 6-5, and five, and if we lose to Oakland, we're pretty much mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. We talked quite candidly in that meeting about what we needed to do to get this thing back on track. The solution was simple. Get the ball into the hands of Kellen Winslow. Back to throw on third down and foul. Goes into the end zone. Touchdown, Kellen Winslow. He's gonna throw for it this time. Into the end zone, Winslow. Touchdown, Chargers. Looking in the end zone for Winslow. Fifth touchdown pass came from Chuck Muncie on a halfback option. And of course, when Chuck Muncie gets the ball, people pay attention. 
they uh, rush right after Chuck, and I just slip into the end zone for that little three-yard dink. And I would like to spike the football back then, and I ran out of spikes. <laughs> we also knew it was the last time we were going to play the Raiders in Oakland because they were moving to Los Angeles the next year. At the end of the game, you look up, and there's 55 points against the Raiders in Oakland. And there's still fans here. This is great, because we can tell each one of them how we feel, because we're never going to see them again. It was like, yeah, you, and you, and you, and you. Look at the scoreboard. You know? Blankety, blank, blank, blank. So that was a lot of fun. That was probably as much fun as I've ever had going off a field. The next week was Chuck Muncie's moment. San Diego's Superback scored four touchdowns before halftime as the Chargers moved back into first place with a win over Denver. But after a loss to the Bills, the Chargers faced a must-win situation in Tampa. The offense mounted a fourth-quarter comeback that would only be completed if animal preservation activist Rolf Bernerska could kick a last-second field goal. He had this thing for endangered species. Every field goal, people pledged money. So when he would miss, he'd come to the sideline, we'd all be making animal sounds. Ooh, 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 oh, Rolf, feed me! Oh, oh, you're killing us, Rolf! So, so I just remember before he went out, I said, Rolf, just think about all of the animals that are gonna die at the zoo if you don't make this kick. The animals ate well that night and the Chargers were now one win away from clinching the AFC West. It's for the division championship. It's Monday Night Football. It doesn't get any sweeter. This is why you play professional football. Hand off, going here to James Brooks in the backfield, over right tackle to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, spins out of the ground from Packard, the 5, breaks two more tackles, touchdown Chargers! Back to pass this pounce again, steps up under pressure, throwing deep to Joyner. Great catch! Touchdown, Chargers! The Chargers have won the AFC West. They're dancing in the aisles. Bring on the rest of the NFL. Hey, do we have any character? That's all I want to know. Yeah, but do we have any character? We were very focused in the locker room after the game. Uh, relieved, I think, was a big part of it and what's next is more important because we had failed the uh, two previous years. At that point, you've already been in the playoffs, you've already been to a championship game. It's big, it's Monday night, it's the Raiders, but it's, there are bigger things out there. The Chargers began their postseason in Miami. The sultry local weather presented nearly as many problems as the Dolphins. Coriel gets this thought in his mind that it's going to be hot and humid, so he read somewhere that if you eat bananas, the potassium is going to keep you from cramping. So Pat Kern, the business manager uh, for the team, had to go out late at night and find bananas for everybody and put them in their room. Well, that's a lot of bananas. I don't know if there was a banana shortage in Miami or what, and I guess they were like a dollar a banana at the time. Don Coyle gets these little thoughts. They take over everything. Oh, Jesus. Bananas. We're going to win with bananas. Those popsicles in training camp were great, but bananas. And that's why we love Coach Coriel. The bananas did it for us. You think? Who knows? It didn't hurt. It also didn't hurt to have Wes Chandler on special teams. This is Wes Chandler, and he is all trouble in open field. And Wes Chandler put down the distance. Great coaching by Mark Braden, our special teams coach. Well, he put Wes in as a short return man. He wasn't a return man. My job was to peel out to the outside and kick out the contain man. I couldn't have broken a pane of glass with that block. But I got between me and the guy, all of a sudden I just felt this whoosh right under my butt. And there he goes, off to the races. The 
Chargers added three more scores to take a stunning 24 to nothing lead by the end of the first quarter. But by halftime, the large lead had melted in the Miami heat. Steps up, throws it downfield, it is complete. The lateral back at the 20, the 10, the 5, into the end zone, touchdown. Oh, they did it with a gadget. The hook and ladder right before the half. I think that totally woke up the sleeping giant, got the crowd back into it, and then once that hook and ladder with Tony Nathan, man, it was on like the break of dawn. The Chargers stormed back, led by their tight end. Kellen Winslow loves to play, and he loves being the star. And we loved him being the star because when he was, we were going to do just fine. And I think that's where a player's ego is a tremendous asset. His ego was under control, but yet he wanted to push the envelope on each and every play. The Dolphins were determined to try to stop him. Did a good job beating him up, trying to get him out of the game. They did get him out of the game for a short time because of different injuries and dehydration and everything. Ellen Winslow with a Hall of Fame date, 12 receptions today, but now he's down. That's just fatigue, folks. He has played every play as hard as he could. Gosh, I mean, he had a bad shoulder, he had cramps, he was hurting, locked up, found a way to go back on the field. One of the great individual performances in the history of sports. Winslow caught nearly everything in sight. But it was the catch he didn't make that proved to be the biggest play of the game. All right, give me a good three now, Kellen. Let's go split right, fade aggressive on white. Ready? On the play, Winslow is the primary receiver. In fact, it's very similar to the play that he'd scored on earlier. When I dropped back, I saw that Winslow was double covered. But that never scared me, <laughs> throwing to Winslow. So I felt if I could buy a little time, I know I could just loft it up there softly and he can catch it. Well, he had nothing left at that point. He could not jump. So the ball sailed over his head, incomplete in my mind. Throws it toward the end zone. Touchdown San Diego. Catching it was James Brooks. We've run that play a thousand times. James Brooks' job on that play is to block the weak side linebacker. And then if nobody comes, just stay in and block. Well, JB saw me running. He went down the field to the back of the end zone. He ran, saw me, saw Winslow, and just ran and ran and ran, saw the ball, and went and got it. And to this day, it's the most incredible single play I've ever been a part of because it was an overthrown, incomplete pass. And yet it was a touchdown to tie one of the greatest games ever. But overtime wasn't assured until Winslow made a game-saving play on special teams. It's called the emergency do or die. It doesn't matter if you are a starter, if you've got the biggest contract on the team. It doesn't matter. My job was to be the jumper. And the football season comes down to this. That was incredible. That was incredible. And he said he just barely got it with the side of his hand. At the time, I thought I was soaring, just hanging up there like Michael Jordan, waiting for the ball to come up so I could swat it down, and then I would drift slowly back down to the ground. But when I look at it on film, I mean, you probably could have slid a credit card under my head. <laughs> I wasn't very high at all. This epic battle had become a war of attrition. Deep into overtime, it was the Chargers who'd be the last men standing. Threw a ball to Chandler, and he got the wind knocked out. So now he's on the sidelines. The next play, Charlie at the end of the play got hit pretty hard along the sidelines, and he wasn't in the game for the next play. So we're now, we're running out of guys, and uh, we better get in the end zone soon or get a field goal. And Luther holds, it is up, and the game is 
is over. The San Diego Chargers win a 29-yard field goal by Rolf Benerska. And the Chargers move on to the AFC Championship game. But one Charger wasn't moving anywhere. And that's when my back, my hamstrings, my calves all cramped up. Just from my waist down, just cramped up on both sides. You couldn't get off the field, so I think it was Eric Sievers and Billy Schultz had to carry him. It's like it's the old Spartan getting carried off on his shield. Pretty awesome. And then you just start realizing how tired you are, looking around at bodies strewn on the field because there were guys that just didn't want to get up. And in fact, Big Ed and Louis Kelcher were laying next to each other because they were on the field goal team. They looked down, they saw Winslow being taken off the field with the cameras and everything. And I think Louis said to Big Ed, he says, you know, they never pick up fat guys. We're gonna have to get up by ourselves. Hey, we dug as deep as we hey, can get, you're right. and we, we came did. up. That's where you come up in. That's where you come up in. All right, another season next week. Give the game ball, everybody. Everybody gets the game ball, of course. Oh! 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 Green 80. Green 80. One win away from the Super Bowl, the warm weather Chargers face the worst possible conditions in the AFC Championship. They were predicting unbearably extreme cold weather, but we didn't realize what we were getting into until we got off the plane in Cincinnati that Saturday. And then we woke up on Sunday to the coldest day in the history of the 20th century. 59 below zero wind chill. 30 to 40 mile an hour winds. Hot steam coming off the Ohio River as we're going into the stadium. Looked like a jacuzzi. I get out and I go down the tunnel and it, and it hits you. It's like somebody threw a hundred knives at you. And I run right back into the locker room. Everybody's going, what's up? And I go, well, first of all, start taking off everything you're putting on, because A, you can't move, and B, not gonna help. I still have frostbite in my right big toe because of that. And in my right thumb, I feel it when it gets cold. How Dan played that game with no gloves on at quarterback is beyond me. If you look at a football, it's not round. It has two points on each end. And if you don't throw a perfect spiral, the wind will take it in all different ways. It's almost like taking a shoebox out in the wind and throwing a shoebox. And there were times if you got it out of spiral, you just had no idea where it was going to come down. I'm sure there was some effect for individual players in dealing with the cold. It can become a distraction because you're so focused on trying to stay warm versus what your job needs to be or executing of that task on that particular play. We were so focused on survival and uh, maybe didn't play up to the level that we could have. But you give Cincinnati credit, they made the adjustment. They were going to show us how tough they were, and maybe they did. They won the ball game. And there were only two guys on the field that didn't have gloves on, Kenny Anderson and myself. But he played brilliantly, and Kenny's advantage is that he threw tight spirals, and I didn't always throw spirals. In my mind, that was the biggest part of us losing the game. Anderson back to throw. Looks down into the end zone. Touchdown, ML Harris. We were disappointed. And of course, you can always look back at Cincinnati and go, what if, what if, what if, you know, different day, a different condition might have been, but it just didn't happen for us. And going to the airport and not being able to fly out for three hours because I couldn't de-ice the plane. And we sat in Covington, Kentucky, in the airport with nothing open. So we were in Boone County, Kentucky on a Sunday without any alcohol because there is no liquor sold in Boone County on Sunday, boy. Don't you understand? <laughs> 
We sat in that hole and for hours and couldn't get back to San Diego. At least let us get home. You beat us. You go to the Super Bowl, but don't keep us prisoners here, please. The next few seasons were difficult ones for Don Coryell and the San Diego Chargers. I think what happened was we had run the cycle of having an opportunity to win the big one. We got older. We just kind of slid those years after that. Three of our front four, who really was the strength of our defense, were up with the 49ers winning Super Bowls. Muncie was gone. Dan was starting to get hurt. The injuries were catching up. Gene Klein finally just got tired of dealing with contracts, fell in love with horse racing, and finally said, you know what? I've had enough. Horses are never going to renegotiate. I'm getting in the horse racing business. The Spanos family wanted to buy it. So Gene just decided to sell it. And once you change ownership, all hell breaks loose because the coach gets fired, the quarterback gets retired, and it takes a while to rebuild the team in that ownership's way, in the way they want to do things. With all due respect to the 49ers, Dallas Cowboys, who also ran our offense, and on and on and on, I in my heart believe that we had the greatest offense in the history of the National Football League. We changed the way people play defense. They had to change philosophy playing defense because of us. Their teams today still running that offense, the same terminology that won Super Bowls with that St. Louis Rams. When they won Super Bowl, I could step into the St. Louis Rams huddle and run their plays. It's the same offense. To me, the Hall of Fame is about influence on and contribution to the game of pro football. It is my sincere hope that my inclusion to the Hall of Fame helps open the doors for so many others who have not participated in a Super Bowl game. It's not like it's going to define my life or anything, not winning a Super Bowl. But I think about it. I think about it all the time. And to get so close and know that you could have, should have done it, pisses you off, hurts. It's the holy grail. It's how your career is measured, whether you want a ring or not. If you have won a ring, you go into a very elite group. We were never able to step into that elite group. I mean, how, how big is winning a Super Bowl? How big is it? Well, merely from a football point of view, it's the biggest thing in your life. We'll be judged based upon our failures, but also upon our entertainment value and how people remember us. People remember the San Diego Chargers as a team that they enjoyed watching. All I care about is the fans. And if they liked it, great. Some will be critical, some will say, ah, they never won the big one. But you know what? We tried, and we had fun trying. We did leave our mark. We will not be forgotten. This NFL Films production has been brought to you by NFL Network. Watch the National Football League 24 hours a day on NFL Network.